Well, good day. This is Tony from Ephraim International Ministries. And uh, today I want to continue on the series that I started um, last week called Holiness, Righteousness, and Selfishness. And the thing that we want to do in this series is, um, is emphasize the importance um, of us walking holy lives. That it's not enough just to um, claim the mantle of Jesus Christ in our lives and then um, decide to uh, do things our way that are not based on the Word of God. Um, and that, uh, you know, in the, in the Hebraic mindset, believing and doing are synonymous. They actually go hand in hand. So when, when somebody says that they believe, it's assumed that they're walking um, based on that belief. Okay, and in our case, um, you know, we need to attain to, to the scriptures and the belief that not only is Yeshua, Jesus, the Messiah, okay, but there's another aspect to that. And that is he wants us to turn away from transgression, which means you're, you were walking in sin. Now you're turning back and you're walking the ways of God. And that's the whole idea behind this. Okay. And so we, you know, we want to try to emphasize that, you know, there's a reason why Yeshua says that the way is narrow. It's not wide. It ain't something where everyone can just jump on board and, and, and just take upon the name of Christ and then walk in the ways of the devil, you know, the other days of the week. It doesn't work that way. Okay, God expects us to walk in His ways. Uh, not only that, but He commands us. Okay, so we're going to read a lot of scriptures today to emphasize this, this concept of, of, of righteousness and, and holiness and, and, and selfishness. Um, so what I want to do is I want to turn to the book of Psalms. There's a few scriptures here. Um, we'll read in Proverbs. Okay, and we're going to begin to emphasize and, and see how important uh, this is to God. Okay, so Psalm 85, 13, as we, um, as we turn there, praise be to God. It says, Righteousness shall go before him and shall set us in the way of his steps. Okay, so, so righteousness is going to cause us to get there. Okay, again, and I'm going to keep repeating myself, it's about living this thing out. Lip service unto the Lord our God is just not enough. It ain't going to cut it. And although we need to have that initial lip service, those who call upon the name of the Lord and those who confess that He is the Christ shall be saved. Yes, that is the first step. We need to move forward with that. And, and this is what God expects of us. And we're, we're going to keep reading about this. And we're going to pound this. Psalm 97, verse 10. It says that, Ye that love the Lord hate evil. He preserveth the souls of his saints. He delivereth them out of the hands of the wicked. Okay, so... Do you see how direct this is? It's very simple. If you love him, you will hate evil. Okay? It's an action-reaction type thing. But the question is, do we love him enough that we're going to absolutely pound on getting the sin out? Pound on this, having this desire to hate evil in our lives. Okay? And I know that's strong stuff, but that's how the... Um, the writer of this wants to portray this okay which it's probably David I haven't checked yet I know all the Psalms aren't written by David but there's a good chance that this one is um, Psalm 119 which is one of my favorite chapters in the whole Bible there's 176 verses divided by 22 stanzas of eight verses and each stanza represent a Hebrew letter and the reason why I love this chapter is because every single chapter you're gonna see that in one word, it's going to emphasize keeping the law of God, whether, whether it's using the word commandment, law, ordinance, um, statute, judgment, word. You're going to notice that every single verse, 176 verses, emphasize this, okay? And as we're going to see later on, the law of God is righteousness. 
The law of God defines what righteousness is. Okay? Um, so it says in verse 1 there, it says, Blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk in the law of the Lord. Well, you know, you're going to get that argument. Well, that applied before Jesus came. Okay? No, I'm sorry. His word is the same yesterday, today, forever. Nothing written there. In, in fact, there isn't one scripture where it talks about when Christ comes, all this stuff is going to be done away with, and Jesus is going to come, come up with a new set of rules, and we're just going to follow them. Okay? No, it doesn't say that. Um, I need to make a little bit of adjustment. Give me a second. Sorry about that. Let's read verse 2. Blessed are they that keep his testimonies, and that seek him with the whole heart. They also do no iniquity. They walk in his ways. Gosh, I love this. So, no iniquity means what? It means they do no sin. Okay, well, that's impossible. Well, listen. Listen, okay. The Bible says, Be ye holy as I am holy. Now, of course, we're not going to get to a point where we're never going to sin. And if we do, we have an advocate. Yeshua the Messiah, our high priest. Okay? You know, he's talking about living in a way where you're always seeking after holiness. Yes, we're going to make mistakes. But like I said, because we have that advocate that picks us up, okay, and, and of course, his blood once and for all that was shed for us paid the price. Okay? So it, it's like something to fall back on, but it's not something that we need to take advantage of advantage of either right we need to keep on that narrow path and get to a point where yeah one day we're gonna have those immortal bodies but we're never gonna sin again but we're not there yet the question is are you attaining are you trying to attain that which is a good thing okay um, let's go to Proverbs real quick uh, Proverbs 16 there's a lot of good stuff in here Verse 1, Proverbs 16, 1, it says, The preparations of the heart and man, and the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. All the ways of a man are clean in his own eyes, but the Lord weigheth the spirits. And, and that's the problem. In our own eyes, we, we always think that things are hunky-dory, right? Until the prophets waltz in and they, uh, they say otherwise, right? And um, that's, that's funny, I think. Commit thy works unto the Lord, and thy thoughts shall be established. Okay, so so you want things to turn around in your life, okay, and you want to be going in the right direction. Here's the way to do it. Okay, are we committing our ways, our works to Him? Everything you know, it says elsewhere. You know, um, if we acknowledge Him in all our ways, that He's going to direct our paths, right? And that's, that's what I want in my life. I want God directing me all the time. Because I know my way is going to lead to probably destruction. Maybe not tomorrow or next week, but ultimately the ways of man are going to lead to destruction. It's inevitable. Okay? And, and, and that's why He designed us so that we can rely on Him. And that's the beauty about all this. Uh, verse 4, The Lord hath made all things for Himself, yea, even the wicked for the day of evil. <laughs> and some of us can't really grasp our head around that. You mean he created the wicked? You're darn right he did. Okay? And you know, obviously over here it talks about specifically for the day of evil. Okay? And of course this is the end times, right before right before the day of the Lord, when he comes back and just um, cleans house, right? <laughs> Uh, verse 5, everyone that is proud in heart is an abomination to the Lord. Though hand, join in hand, he shall not be unpunished. And this is one of my favorite verses. It says, by mercy and truth, iniquity is purged. And by the fear of the Lord, men depart from evil. And, and the reason why that speaks to me so much is because I just finished doing a whole series on the fear of God. And, and, and the importance of, of, of having the fear of God in your life and the results in your life. 
And, and, and one of the reasons we have that is because by the fear of the Lord, as it says here, men depart from evil. Okay, and we've since gone away from that, all the generations, even today. It's, it's hard to see people that are focused on, on walking in the ways of God, walking in the fear of the Lord. Um, but it's coming. Okay, it's coming. Uh, verse 7, When a man's ways please the Lord, Jehovah, he maketh even his enemies to be at peace with him. Imagine that. Imagine that. That the, the fact that you're pleasing him so much, he's going to cause your enemies to be at, ple at uh, peace with you. Yeah, but that's of the Old Testament. Well, you know what? Give me some of that. I want it. Okay, give me some of that bondage. I want it. If it's going to bless the socks off of me and, and cause this to happen, I'm all in. I am all in. Verse 8, better is little with righteousness than great revenues without right. Yeah, you're better having little, but walk in the ways of God than having a bunch and uh, not. Okay? We're, we're here for a short time, guys. Make the best of it. It's all about the other side of this thing. It's all about your place in the kingdom of God. But first, you need to be getting in the kingdom of God to begin with. Okay? That's the first step. If you're not getting in the kingdom, don't matter your place. You're not getting a place. And, you know, I, I believe most of us that are listening are a part of the kingdom. Okay? Verse 9, A man's heart deviseth his way, but the Lord d direct his steps. And boy, does he. Never underestimate, especially if you're living in holiness and righteousness, never underestimate the hand of God in your life and the angels that He has placed before you and behind you to direct your steps and guard you. Isn't that what you want? That's what I want. I want the Lord God to have His angels all around about me and camped about me. I want that, especially especially in these last days where there's a good chance that we're going to experience this beast called the Antichrist and this, this beast system and the mark of the beast. Okay, and the persecution that's going to come across the face of the earth against God's people. We're going to want to be prepared for that. We're not going to want to be a bunch of milk toast Christians okay, that don't, don't know sick them from go get them. We need to understand this stuff. It's imperative. Let's go to Isaiah 4, verse 3. And it shall come to pass that he that is left in Zion, he that remaineth in Jerusalem, shall be called holy, and every one that is written among the living in Jerusalem. And I believe this is during the thousand years when Jerusalem comes down. 26 1. In that day shall this song be sung in the land of Judah. We have a strong city. Salvation will God appoint for walls and bulwarks. Open ye the gates, that the righteous nation which keepeth the truth may enter in. Hallelujah with that. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusteth in thee. Okay? So, do whatever you need to do to get yourself in a point where you're always in constant reminder to serve him in in righteousness okay whether it's you know these uh these these things called the zitzi okay that uh it's in numbers a commandment to, to wear them to to remind us because god's always knowing that we're going to have our heads other places and it's going to be easy for us to be distracted and to serve him okay I, I remember years ago people used to have those bracelets what would jesus do Okay, and although that's not scriptural, if it's going to help you serve him better, then I'm all for it. Okay, but he's already provided us ways to be reminded. I, I know some of the Jews wear the the the, the tefillins that they wear around their heads, the big boxes. I mean, I I believe that verse is not literal. It talks about um, keeping your commandments as of like their front ones on your forehead, okay, because uh, they emphasize your thoughts, and of course your hand, it says as well, and they emphasize the work of your hand as well. 
but I'm not going to judge them for doing that. If it's going to make them serve God better, hey, I'm all for that. Okay, so again, it's 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 the heart of the command. It's the spirit of the law, and that's the important part of it. Okay, so as long as your your mind is focused on Him all day, obviously, you know, when you're driving down the road, make sure you focus on that road. You know, if you're if you're at the job and you're you're cutting something. That's going to, you know, if you're not paying attention, it's going to cut your finger off. Then I would advise you paying attention to what you're doing, right? Obviously, um, you know, let's be, um, let's have common sense here, right? Isaiah 26, 9. With my soul have I desired thee in the night. Yea, with my spirit within me will I seek thee early. For when thy judgments are in the earth, the inhabitants of the world will learn righteousness. And yeah, the, the judgments are still on the earth. And we are right now. We're learning righteousness. Are we there yet? No, we're not. And I'll tell you something. We're not going to get there until he shows up. But again, it's we're on that path. It's like Paul says, we are running the race. And if you're running the race, that means you haven't finished the race yet. But you're running it. You're not staying stagnant. And heaven forbid you haven't turned back. Okay? So, and that's important. Isaiah 32, 17. Gosh, there's some good stuff here in Isaiah. And the work of righteousness shall be peace, and the effect of righteousness, quietness, and assurance forever. And, and this is what it brings, my brothers and sisters. It brings peace. It brings righteousness. It brings assurance that you just know that you know that you know that you've trusted him. Isaiah 35, 4. Hallelujah. It says, Say them, I'm sorry, say to them that are of a fearful heart, be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance. Even God with a recompense, he will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap as a heart, and the tongue of the dumb sing. For in the wilderness shall waters break out, and streams in the desert. And the parched ground shall become a pool, and the thirsty land springs of water, and the inhabitants of dragons, where each lay shall be grass with reeds and rushes. And a highway shall be there, in a way it shall be called the way of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it, but it shall be for those. The wayfaring men, though fools, shall not err therein. No lion shall be there, nor any ravenous beast shall go up thereon. It shall not be found there, but the redeemed shall walk there. And the ransom of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with songs and everlasting joy in their heads. They shall obtain joy and gladness, and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. Listen up, guys. There is a place of bliss that is coming to the children of God that's going to separate us from the rest of this world forevermore. And it's the very thing that we all need to look forward to. This is what, it's, this, is what this is all about, guys. This is the fruit of our, of our salvation when the Messiah returns and we will be separate from the rest of the world. I mean, I would encourage you, if you're ever down and out, if you're having an issue, if the devil's trying to attack you, you need to remind him of what's coming. Okay, because the word of the Lord, it brings joy, it brings peace. And ultimately, guys, it brings hope. And the world cannot claim this to themselves. Only, only for the children of God. Let's turn to Isaiah 51, 7. 51, 7. Hearken unto me, ye that know righteousness, the people in whose heart is my law. Fear not the approach of men, neither be afraid of their revelings. Their revelings. 
Okay, so evidently you can't know righteousness if you don't know his law. Because like I said before, his law, his Torah, okay, which should probably be interpreted as, as instructions, not law. His instructions determine, they define what righteousness is. And I, and, and I keep saying this in, in the book of 1 John, it's, it, it defines you what sin is. Not what I think sin is, or what the first church of the righteous thinks that sin is. No, what does the Bible say sin is? In the book of 1 John, it says that sin is a transgression of God's law. So if you're taking the law of God and you're hammering it and beating it to the cross, then what's sin then? There's no more sin. Yeah, that's a fairy tale. Okay, we're not there yet, guys, when we have no sin. We still, we're still dealing with this stuff, okay? And the law is as applicable today as it was 3,000 years ago when, when Moses... Um, actually, 4,000 years ago when, when Moses uh, came down with it. And don't kid yourself, it was always there. It was there before creation, okay? So that's another teaching right there. Um, Isaiah 60, 60, verse 21. Thy people also shall be all righteous. They shall inherit the land forever. The branch of my planting, the work of my hands, that I may gl be glorified. Okay, again, things to look forward to. Okay, when Messiah returns and we're living in the land there, the new land, it's going to be full of righteousness. Anything but righteousness will not cut it. You're not getting in. It's not going to happen. Okay, so like I said, the people living in there, okay, and I like to think I'll be there, that's part of the hope, we're all going to be living in righteousness. Okay, I believe we're going to have our new bodies then. Okay, but we're still going to have the nations around us, and they're, they're going to have to learn the ways of the Lord. And that's why it says, "The word of the Lord will come out of Zion." I'm sorry, it says the, the 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 law will come forth out of Zion, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem, because the nations are going to have to learn the ways of God, and that's going to come. And that's exciting. Let's turn to the book of Matthew here. But again, I want to emphasize this thing, this business of, of living right. Because that's what this is all about. That's what the kingdom of God is all about. Matthew 5, 6. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Okay, so it's not like something that we can't obtain. I mean, I remember it talked about in the Torah where it's not up there, where it's like, oh, go, go get it for me. It ain't over in, in uh, Timbuktu Timbuk where we have to send somebody to go get it. No, it's right there. It's right here within you. Okay, it says if you hunger and thirst after it, you're going to be filled. Okay, the question is, are we hungering and thirsting after it? Or are we hungering and thirsting about other things? that are unprofitable in our lives. Verse 8, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. So I guess we're going to have to be pure in heart in order to see Him. What does that mean, though? What does it mean to be pure in heart? Are we having some of those calluses that talk to us and, uh, and start judging people? Or having these thoughts about somebody because we haven't forgiven them in the past? Okay, or is our heart in the process of getting cleaned up with a heart of pure? Is that attainable? Sure it is, but it, it requires work. It requires us being hungry and thirsty after the things of God. Father, what if, what's in my heart that's not right, that's not lined up in your work? Show me so I can get rid of it and I can move along with this thing and have the anointing in my life increase so I can, I can lay my hands upon the sick and they shall recover. Instead of being stuck in the same rut because we're too busy appeasing the flesh and not uh, focusing on what I can get rid of in my life so I can please Him. And, um, you know, and again, guys, you know, I'm talking to myself first. You know, I go through this every day 
and it's it's a, every day it's a battle but you have to guard your heart you know it's it's already hard enough to get rid of the bad stuff okay and if you're not guarding it what you're doing is you you're, you're putting more stuff in your bucket and it just it's just going to be harder and harder so I love where it says guard your heart um, Matthew 5 48 it says be ye therefore perfect even as your father which is in heaven is perfect oh boy perfect what are you talking about what are you talking about Yeshua perfect how are you expecting to be perfect okay again God ain't gonna tell us to do something that's not attainable okay now he realizes we're not flesh and blood perfect doesn't mean um, to never ever ever sin no let's not be foolish here okay the, the the meaning of this word in the Greek reflects somebody who's mature mature in the things of God okay and, and if you're mature you're not a baby no more you're growing and that's what God's looking at are you growing in this thing as opposed to what being stagnant like I said before or heaven forbid you're turning around and walking the other way okay that's why it says Paul says work out your salvation with fear and trembling every day guys every <laughs> we can't afford to take a day off because when we do that's when the devil comes in okay and then he wrecks havoc why because we're not on guard Romans 12 1 I beseech you therefore brethren by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice holy acceptable unto God which is your reasonable service and yeah Paul's really hammering on this and be not conformed to this world but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God okay so it's going to take more. It's going to take us renewing our mind. And how are we going to do that? Through the Word of God. We're going to have to you know, set our standards with God a lot higher than where we are now. And maybe you are there where your standards are really high. And amen to that. Okay, but it doesn't end there. There's always something higher with God. Okay, always something higher. Okay, because, you know, it's one thing to sing... It's one thing to sin with your hands, with your body, but it's a whole new ball game when we're starting to sin with your mind, okay? And a lot of the stuff usually starts there anyways. Romans 13, 12 says, The night is far spent and the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Okay? Now, Think about it, guys. Do you think that Paul was talking to a bunch of heathen here? Or maybe he was talking to the church, God's people. Okay? So we need to understand, like, do we, do we get the fact that Paul was dealing with so many issues? And a lot of these things that he was writing were, were, were letters that he was posting to, to certain churches that were dealing with certain issues? Okay, it, it's like what we're doing now is we're, we're kind of uh, reading the mail. We're going to our, our neighbor's mailbox and grabbing a letter that was written to the neighbor from somebody else. That's what we're doing. We're like peeking through the mail. Okay, so, I mean, I don't think Paul ever thought that his letters were once going to be collected and, 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 and put in, in a book called the New Testament. I don't think he thought that. Now, does that mean that I don't think there's weight in those letters? Of course not. No, Paul was a man of God. He was anointed of God. Okay, so let's put that to bed. So, like I said before, it's not enough to have Christ in our hearts. We need to do our we need to do our part to do what to cast off all the evil and walk in the light. Okay, the law of the Lord is light. Anything besides that is evil. Okay, please understand that. Please make that distinction. God is black and white here. If it doesn't conform to His Word, it's evil. Okay, there's no gray area with God. Verse 13, Romans 13, 13. Let us walk honestly as in the day, 
not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envying. But put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ, and make not provision for the flesh, to fulfill the lust thereof. Okay? Some of us need to be really honest with ourselves and, and you know, and assess our walk with God. And it's a good thing to do on a daily basis, not even on a weekly or monthly, daily. It's healthy. Okay? It's going to be a good way to, um, for God to show us where our strengths and our weaknesses are. And we need to work on our weaknesses, but also um, try to hone in our strengths as well. Okay, if need be, write a list. Okay, write down the things that you know that so easily besets you, like Paul talks about. Okay, like I said before, what about the thoughts that you're having? Are you thinking about something else? Somebody else, maybe of a, of a different uh, sex that maybe you shouldn't be thinking of? Okay, Th these all matter. And, and some of us don't maybe focus on that. But these could be the very things that are that are uh, holding us back. Okay? And, you know, not trying to condemn anyone because we all go through these things. These are part of the struggles that we have to overcome. When Yeshua talks about overcoming, okay, he ain't talking about overcoming the big bad wolf. He's talking about overcoming the sin in your life. That's what he's talking about. And that's why he can say, guys, I've overcome. I have overcome. And He has given us the ability with the Holy Ghost on the inside of us, with the power and the fortitude to do the same thing. Okay? So, bless God for that. Hallelujah. We need to thank God every day for that. Okay? And like I said, write these things down. And then after that, pray that God deliver you from whatever it is that you're having problems with. Okay, and God, through the Holy Ghost, He's more than happy to assist in that process. Why? Because He wants us to be in that place where we can call upon, we can call upon the Lord and He's going to answer us and say, Here I am. Okay, is that happening in your life? And, you know, again, not judging anyone. Only you can judge for yourself. And that's what we're talking about here. Having that, that self-assessment, looking in that spiritual mirror. Okay, because... You know, the fact of the matter is a lot of things that we're dealing with and are, are evil spirits. Okay, and the minute you get rid of those spirits, you then get rid of the sin. And a lot of us don't think of it that way, but that's what it is. Because it's Satan trying to buffer. And he's trying to find that in. And the minute that you permit him to come in, because he ain't coming in unless you allow him. Remember that. That's how it works. And guess what? Just as much as you let him in, you can also open the door and kick his rear side on the way out as well. Okay, so you have that authority as well. Um, but this whole thing about uh, the spiritual battle, okay, it's like, you know, the Bible talks about when a spirit does leave you. Okay, like this is all part of the deliverance process. What's going to happen? It talks about how it's going to go to a dry place. And then it's going to be there for a season. And then you're going to have a little bit of, of a reprieve for a bit, whether it's a week or two weeks or a month or maybe only three days. And then the Bible says that the Spirit's going to want to come back and bring with Him seven other spirits that are worse than that Spirit. Then what's going to happen? Then you're going to start to feel that, uh, that oppression again in your life. Why? Because like I said, that Spirit came back wanting to come in back in your house again with the other spirits. And then what? Like I said, you have the authority to tell them, rise up and say, listen, pal, I've been delivered of this. Be gone in the name of Yeshua, Jesus Christ, because now I can handle you now that you're outside and out in the inside. Okay? And they'll try to do this three, four, five times. And you have to apply the same application that I just told you. From the stay out okay and then you can deal with another spirit until you get cleaned up right but the problem is is that and before I share that I want to take a drink 
The problem is, is that people are so used to sinning in their life that they're comfortable with it, right? And, you know, and, and that's why it's hard for them to transition out of that lifestyle into the things of God, right? But, you know, like my old prophet used to tell us, if you can just beat one, then the rest, even though they're tougher, they're easier to beat because you have the methodology. You have the solution on how to do it. Okay, so focus on that one. And I would, I would suggest that you focus on the easy ones. Okay, maybe you're into lying. Maybe you're into um, gossiping. Maybe you have some judgmental thoughts. Whatever it is, work on that one. And then once you beat it, you're going to have the confidence to, do, to, have, um, to, to go through the same process again and beat the other ones that are maybe a little bit more tougher. Okay? So again, line, line upon line, precept upon precept. It ain't going to happen overnight. But again, the Lord God, Jehovah, wants to see that progress in you. Okay, are you in a better place today than you were, let's say, six months ago? Okay, and if the answer is no, and heaven forbid, if the answer is, shoot, man, I'm, I'm worse, then we're going to have to reassess ourselves. Maybe to the point where we have to go back to the base of the cross. Maybe. And that, if that's the case, let it be. It's better for you to go back to the base of the cross than you for you for you to keep going and you're just lying to yourself. He ain't gonna work anything in your life anyways. Okay, so sometimes it's just a, a point of just humbling yourself, and that's good. Hey, do what you gotta do. God's gonna receive you. He's gonna receive you more when you're humble than, well, you know, God, I'm um, I've been in this for six years and yeah, I'm faltering, but uh, I'm just going to keep pushing. No, get back and um, shore things up. Okay? And then sometimes you hear people talk about, well, you know, I just can't help myself, right? Or, well, Jesus is going to forgive me and everything's going to be fine. No, it ain't going to be fine. That's why Yeshua says, you know, you know, he says, go and sin no more lest a worse thing come upon you. Okay, so do you think he knew something? So we have to keep this in the back of our mind. When he forgives us, he expects us to not go sin no more, lest a worse thing come upon you. And uh, you don't get this preached a lot in church, do we? Okay. But this is going to be the beginning of us coming into this thing called holiness. Okay, and, and, and most of most of us are not already there. So let's not, let's not fool ourselves here. Let's be honest. Okay, because this thing with holiness is not, uh, it's not a cakewalk where you can begin to, you know, turn that switch on and then, you know, start cleaning yourself up. You know, because it's going to be, like I said before, line upon line, precept upon precept. It's not going to happen overnight. Okay, so like I said, you know, if you have to make that list and work on things one at a time, and it might it might take you a couple months to even get one thing down packed. It might take a week. It might take six months. But um, thank God for His mercies and His patience, because He is patient. Um, let's turn to the Book of Romans, or actually, I think we're still in Romans. Romans fourteen verse seventeen. For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness, peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. Okay, so like I said, let's, let's, let's picture the kingdom of God. We're not going to have any uh, and CNN reporters come on and talk about, uh, you know, this, uh, this 17 gender business. No. It's going to be holiness and righteousness. That's what we're going to be talking about and living out. Okay? And, you know, ultimately... Holiness and righteousness are essentially the same thing. But I guess it sounded better in this title of this series if we just kept them separate, you know. But that's fine. Um, 
But understand when you're when, when you're walking this walk like this, okay, there, there there's a peace with this. But there's also that joy that comes as well. And this is what God wants for us. Understand that God wants us to walk in this peace that goes beyond human understanding. He wants us to walk in the joy. You know, it says in the Bible that the joy of the Lord is my strength and my song, for He has become my salvation, my Yeshua. Yeshua means salvation. Okay, th these are the kind of things that God desires for us. Okay, um, 1 Corinthians 3.16 it says, Know you not that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? Now listen here, guys. We're talking about the Apostle Paul here. And I can guarantee you one thing. Paul was not a, uh, you know, how shall I say this? You know, tiptoe by the tulip type pastor. Okay? He was an apostle. He was a prophet. Okay, he was an anointed man of God. So, and, and, and the thing is, the problem with reading some of the stuff is that you read something on paper, but it doesn't always give us the emotions or, or the extent as to how it was meant to be portrayed. Okay, now think about Paul and who he was. And let's reread this verse. Know you not that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? That's probably how he said that. Again, guys, these were real men in the Bible. They didn't have this uh, high-pitched voice as a result of a uh, particular body part being cut off, okay? Oh, praise God. Verse 17, And if any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. Okay, I want us to understand how serious this is and what he's trying to say here and what he's trying to portray. Okay, this, this is a stern warning to anyone who decides to defile his own temple. Remember the concept. And if you have to do a study in, in Exodus on the, the way that the tabernacle was... Okay, and, and tabernacle to me is synonymous with the temple because both had a holy place and they both had a most holy place where the Ark of the Covenant was. Okay, and Paul equates us to that. He says, guys, we are the temple. Okay, and the temple was a holy place. You walked in there, you had a... And we're talking about the priests here, the sons of Aaron. They had to do what? They had to do their, their mikvahs, their washings. They had to atone for their own sins. Why? Because they were approaching a holy God. And that's how we have to approach Him. Walk before Him clean, undefiled, not to be profaned. And that's why Paul makes this comparison. Why? Because we have the Holy Ghost here. The presence of the Almighty God. The same presence that was in the Ark of the Covenant. Okay, so that's why we need to take this very seriously. Because we have the presence of God living on the inside of us. And by the way, I must say, in terms of the sacrifices... If you read, when they sacrificed, they made their offerings. Never at one point, and this is a little off topic, but I thought I'd share it. Never at one point was there an unclean animal that was sacrificed. Think about that, guys. We are the temple. Are we sacrificing unclean animals in our temple? Food for thought. And yes, that was a pun that was intended. Verse 21, uh, 1 Corinthians 10, 21. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. You cannot be partakers of the Lord's table and of the table of devils. What's he saying here? You can't be into, 
into sin and righteousness at the same time? Because if, if you're into sin, you're going to reap sin. And Paul makes a clear distinction here. Is he talking about anything new? No. He's just reiterating what he already knew since he was this high. Okay, the ways of God are righteousness. And we can, ta- we can find tons of scriptures in the Torah that talk about staying away from, from evil spirits and mediums and they that are necromancers and they that um, are walking in the ways that are, undef- that are defiled. He's just reiterating. He ain't making up anything new here. And that's the thing that we have to think about when we read the New Testament is that nothing is new. There is nothing new under the sun. It's already been established back in the days of Moses. Okay? And, and the reason why it takes so much work in the, in the getting this thing about living righteously is because Satan is going to do his part in making sure that you falter. He's got to do whatever he's got to do to to put those roadblocks in front of you. And that's why, like I said before, we have to stay on guard daily. Darkness does not take a day off from you. They don't go on vacation for a week. No, they're at you all the time. Okay? All the time. Especially if you decide to keep God's word. Why? He ain't going to worry about the heathen. They're already set in their place. He's worried about those that are going to be a threat to his kingdom. And that's what we are. And that's what we should be anyways. Okay, because the fact of the matter is, whatever word that was planted in you, Satan is going to try to come and test you on that word. Why? Because it's going to fulfill the parable of the sower. How many times have we read that parable? The sower planted the word of God. Okay, and... As long as that word is planted in your spirit, man, you're going to have one of four outcomes. You remember that parable? It talks about the seed being sown. It's going to be, some of it's going to, is going to go by the wayside. Some of it's going to be uh, planted um, in the, um, in the stony ground. Some of it is, some of it's going to be planted in the, with the thorns. And some of it's going to be planted in the good ground. Okay, which scenario are you? Because we're all going to fall into one of those four. Okay, let's try to focus on the last scenario where it says that it produces 30, 60, 100 fold. And that's the purpose of the word, because the word is the seed. It's got to produce. And if it's going to get hindered, right, if it's going to get choked up, if it's going to get trampled on, whether it's the cares of this world, whether it's persecution, whether the devil outright just steals it from the get-go. Okay? So, let's consider that. 1 Corinthians 15, 34, as we um, try to wrap this thing up here. 1 Corinthians 15, 34, Awake! I'm sorry, awake to righteousness and sin not. For some have not the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. Okay, so we're starting to see the uh, the uh, the attributes of Paul here. Okay, um, you know, I th- I think it says in an- another place where it says it'll be to your hurt if I showed up. Okay, in other words, I'm gonna if I show up, guys, I'm gonna I'm gonna take you, some of you guys out back by the woodshed. Again, he was stern. He was a prophet of God. He was an apostle. They don't take any, uh, if I shall say, any BS. Okay? Why? Because they were fervent in the Word of God. They were zealous for His Word. They were zealous for, for the righteousness of God. And they didn't take keen or kind to anything that went against it. Okay? I mean, I've heard stories of my mentor... Prophet Tan, back in the day when he would go into churches where the pastors would, you know, they would talk a holy stick, but boy, were they into some serious sin in secret. Okay? And that's why we need to be careful of people laying hands on us. 
for prayer or for deliverance because if those vessels that are laying hands on you are not clean vessels, what's going to happen? It's going to it's called the transfiller of spirits. So whatever unclean spirits that they have, they're going to transfer it unto you. And not only will you leave that place not delivered and not healed, you're going to leave there with more than you bargained for. Okay, so this is serious stuff, guys. You know, and back to Paul. He says here, I speak this to your shame. Okay, he's saying, guys, you should know better than this. Wake up. Okay, and, and that's why I, I, I like Paul, and I understand Paul is misunderstood. And, well, of course, the man was so damn smart, he, most of the time he spoke over their heads, and that's why even Peter warned them. And I, I, I think he was talking to the Galatians there. And that's why the book of Galatians is so contentious and so probably the most misunderstood book in the whole Bible. He was not talking about or talking against keeping God's law. He wasn't. Understand something, guys. If Paul was talking against it, he would have been deemed a false prophet, and rightfully so. Okay? But he wasn't. Because he wasn't talking against it keeping the law of God. Okay, so we're going to wrap this up. Um, but like I said, the word brings upon encouragement, guys. Um, it is full of God dictating to us on how we should live. And there's only one way. There's only one way to live righteous before God. And He defined it for us all the way back in the Torah. Okay, and the thing I love about when Yeshua came is, is that he emphasized it. He's like, guys, don't be worrying about keeping these stupid traditions that the Pharisees are bringing upon you and, and bringing you into bondage. No, no. He's like, take upon my yoke. It's light. It's easy. It's not burdensome. Okay? And, you know, even Paul talks about focusing on the law of liberty. Because that's what it is. You're living the law, you're living in liberty. Why? Because it talks about how sin is bondage. And as long as you're into sin, that's the bondage that we have to worry about getting out of. Okay, we talked about that. Sin is a transgression of the law. So what does that mean? If you're keeping the law, you're not in sin, which means you're not in bondage, which means you're living a life of liberty that God already set out for us to live from the beginning. But because of the hardness of man, Okay, that's why we get into trouble. But anyways, brothers and sisters, be blessed this week. And uh, we'll talk more about this next time. Shalom.